everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be back in Vancouver. It's one of my favorite cities, and I always enjoy coming up here. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Jay for inviting me back. I was here in 2019 and in 2020, and at the time I was talking about uh, this thesis that I was actually started talking about in 2018, but was still kind of developing, and it's called the dollar milkshake theory. Did I just get a quick show of hands if anybody's heard of this or somewhat familiar? Okay, all right. So since I started talking about it, you know, it's kind of taken on a life of its own, which was never really the plan, but you know, it is what it is. And I think some people seem to like it, some people seem to hate it, but it seems to always generate some topics of conversation. So I thought what I would do today, um, because what I have found is as other people talk about it or as other people write about it, there's some confusion about what it actually is, what I think is going to happen, why I think it's going to happen. So what I thought I'd do today is just kind of walk through a big overview of it. I'm not going to go into detail. And then we'll just look at some data. And I'm not going to try to convince you whether I'm right or I'm wrong. I'm going to let you guys figure that out for yourself. Um, and we'll just kind of uh, go from there. I, I think the main thing that it is about is I, I think we are in a transition period of one monetary system to the next monetary system. And I don't know if it's it, during that transition, I don't know on the other side if it's going to be the same people running a stricter version of the same system or the same people running a whole new system or a whole new group of people running a whole new system. But what I'm fairly certain of is that that transition period will not be peaceful and it will not be smooth. And in that, in that transition period, I think the dollar will go higher. And I think a lot of people also think we're in a transition period. And I think a lot of people seem to think it's gonna be because the dollar loses value. And that's where a little bit of the controversy is. I think it's going higher, other people think it's going lower. Um, I don't know which is true, but I'll tell you why I think uh, it goes higher. Um, and the other thing is that I want to make clear is that this is the dollar milkshake theory is not just about the dollar going higher. That, that's actually a fairly small part of it. That's kind of the catalyst. But what it really is, is it's a framework for understanding the, the knock-on effects of a sovereign debt crisis and, and what would happen um, should this uh, come to be. And the reason I think we're going to have a sovereign debt crisis and a currency crisis is I believe that debt matters. I believe that debt has consequences. I don't think you can just borrow forever and not have to feel the pain. And I think we're kind of near the tail end of this sovereign debt super cycle, for lack of a better word. Um, global debt went over 300 trillion last year. And it's not just a US thing, it, this is global. Everybody is kind of in the same situation. And I think when that crisis kicks off, I think capital from around the world will seek out the relative safety of the US dollar. And I think capital will flow into the US dollar. Now that in and of itself is not that controversial. I think people can kind of understand how that could happen for a short period of time. Where it starts to get a little bit controversial is what I said the knock-on effects would be. And I actually think US equities will go higher, um, even though the dollar goes higher. I think gold will go higher, even though the US dollar goes higher. And a lot of people can't square that, the, the US dollar going higher with gold or US dollar going higher with equities. And the reason I think that those will go up is that I don't think it will just be the dollar goes straight up. If the dollar just goes straight up, then equities will come down. But the reaction from the central banks will be to print. But it's not just the Fed. And that's what a lot of people say, the dollar can't go up because the Fed will just print. Well, that's fine, they will, they probably will. But so will the rest of the world, because they are in just as much trouble as we are. And it's a relative game. So if everybody's providing supply, then it comes down to demand. And quite simply, the US has more demand for their currency outside of their country than any other country has for demand outside of their country. So there's a market called the Euro dollar market, which is dollars that exist outside the United States. And that market for dollars outside the United States is bigger than the US dollar market inside the United States. So when the Fed prints, they're not just printing for the United States, they're printing for the whole world. You know, when Australia prints, nobody in Turkey needs Australian dollars. When China prints, not that many people need yuan. Maybe a little bit, but nowhere near the dollar. So, you know, the demand for the dollar, I think, will just trump uh, the demand for the other currencies. And I think what will happen as a result of all the response from the central banks is that you will get gold and dollars rising together versus everything else. Now, when I first started talking about that, that was a little bit hard to square. And even, even myself, I wasn't quite sure how that would work. Um, but that's what I believe. I believe those will be the last two standing versus everything else. Okay, so just as a little review, I wanna say this is what the, what the milkshake theory says. 
It says there will be a sovereign debt crisis. It says capital will flow into the US dollar and US markets, and they will rise over time. The first time I ever mentioned it was on a Real Vision episode. Is Grant here? Where's Grant? Oh yeah. So Grant was gracious enough on Real Vision to let me come on and talk about this in detail. And in the very first sentence of the very first presentation I ever gave about this, I said, this is not a story that ends well. This is a story that ends very, very badly. So this is not a case where the U.S. comes out shining like, you know, like the shining city on the hill. It's just that on a relative basis, I think it will outperform. Um, I actually think that gold and dollar will rise together. I think eventually the dollar will get so strong they have to come up with a new system or reset the system. Um, I don't think the U.S. will willingly give it away. I think that's kind of something that's popped up in the last couple of years that, oh, it's a burden. You know, they've had this great uh, privilege forever, but now it's a burden, so they're going to give it away. I don't think that will happen. And I think despite uh, whether it's deserved or not, whether it's moral or not, whether it should happen or not, I think the U.S. just has a lot of advantages that the rest of the world does not have. But what it does not say, it does not say you should sell everything and just hold on to dollars. It does not say you should sell all your gold because I think gold's going lower. It does not mean you should put all of your money in U.S. equities. It doesn't mean the U.S. empire will last forever and I can't possibly foresee a time where the U.S. would fall. It doesn't mean that there other countries are not trying to de-dollarize. They are trying to de-dollarize. It's just, you know, the success rate is not very high. And it does not say that the U.S. will feel no pain in coming feeling out. So just as a quick summary, that's kind of, uh, you know, what it is and, and, and why I think it's gonna happen. So now let's take a look at, since I've, again, since I very first did this, uh, this interview um, uh, in 2018, since that time, the dollar, the DXY index is up 12%. This is despite all of the COVID response, all the QE, the helicopter money, the bailouts, the government going, uh, uh, backstop. Despite all of that, the DXY is up 12%. It's just a fact. Um, this is, that's just the dollar index. But if we look at a whole basket of currencies from around the world, with very few exceptions, the dollar has outperformed. There's a few that have outperformed by one or two percent, but by and large, the dollar has outperformed every currency in the world since 2018. This is a chart of global equity markets. Now you can see over time, they're, they're, they've tried to, some have done okay, some have done poorly. They've ranged between negative 10 and positive 34%. But this does not include any U.S. equity markets. And again, going back to that first interview, I said the U.S. equity markets would go higher, but it would be punctuated by really scary and dramatic drawdowns along the way. So if I add in, in U.S. equity markets, this is the U.S. equity markets compared to all the others. The Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ have outperformed every other equity market around the world over that time period. And there have been truly dramatic and scary drawdowns along the way. I think that likely continues. But let's just look at the Dow for a second. It's up almost 40% since then, but it's had, it's had drawdowns of 35 and 20% along the way. The S&P is up almost 53%, despite 35 and 25% drawdowns along the way. The NASDAQ is up 70%, despite everything that's happened, um, and, and despite 28 and 35% drawdowns along the way. But let's look at gold. But remember, over the same time period, the dollar's up 12%. Gold's up 48%. But that's in US dollar terms. In Canadian dollar terms, it's up 54%. In Yuan terms, it's up 55%. In Australian dollar terms, it's up 61%. In Euro terms, it's up 68%. In Yen terms, it's up 80%. Brazilian real terms, 134%. And if, for God's sakes, you live in Turkey, it's up 580%. So if you think about it, if the dollar's up over that time period, as we showed versus all the other currencies, and gold is up versus all these other currencies, that is gold and dollars rising together versus everything else. I know everybody here is, a, you know, a lot of people here own mining stocks. Um, and this is a mining stock conference, and there's a number of mining companies out here. And... Since 2018, mine, the, D, the GDXJ, the junior miners, are up 31%. That's pretty good. Uh, they've had a strong pullback since COVID in, in um, um, 2020. But a lot of times people will tell me, well, let me just go to GDX. GDX, the, the, the majors, it's up 45%. But it had a drawdown of 25% since the highs a couple years ago. 
And the Philadelphia gold mining index, it's up 77% since 2018, despite a pullback since 2020. And when I talk to a lot of people, they'll tell me, well, I don't really care about the short-term drawdowns in mining stocks because I'm in it for the long run. And who, who's here is in it for the long run, not worried about a, a daily or a weekly move? Okay. Anybody have an idea of what the GDX has returned since inception? Any guesses? It's negative. Since inception, 12 years ago, the GDXJ is down 63%. That's a fairly long time. But let's go a little bit longer. How about GDX, which is around about 15 years? It's still down 18% since inception. Okay, let's go back to the Philadelphia Gold Mining Index. That's been around for 40 years. Any idea what it's returned since inception? Any guesses? 20%. And that's only as a result of the rally in the last three months. Three months ago, it was negative since inception. So this is not me telling you not to own mining stocks. I think you should own mining stocks. But what this tells me is you don't own mining stocks for the long term. You own mining stocks for the short term. And when you get a 30, 40, 50, 60% run, maybe you take a few profits and then you'd redeploy it on the next pullback. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying that's what the data tells me. But let's go back to the dollar for a second because it's had a, it had a heck of a run in 2020. At one point it was up like 20% and it's had a very hard pullback since then. Now the pullback hasn't really surprised me. I actually thought it would pull back. And I actually, uh, but what people are saying now is that it's going to die. You know, again, they're all back out again. The dollar's dead. They, they forget that six months ago, the rest of the world was on its knees begging for dollars. And again, despite all of the QE, going all the way back to 2008 and all the printing and all the bailouts, the dollar is still up 15% since then, 15 years ago. But when it started pulling back in, in September, at the end of September, I wasn't surprised. And, and the reason I wasn't surprised is inflation expectations were kind of peaking, rate height expectations were starting to fall. And the week prior, three global central banks had to intervene in their markets to strengthen and stop their currencies from, from collapsing. So when you're at this level, at the end of September, the dollar was at its highest point in, I don't know, I don't know how many years. The VIX was at its highest in two or three years. Equities were at their lowest in two or three years. And that's the point where you know central banks are going to come in and they're going to try to fix it. And they're either going to fix it or it's all hell's going to break loose. And they were able to get it under control. And now, just four months later, five months later, um, despite, and the dollar pulling back, the bearish bets against the dollar are almost as big as they were in the summer of 2020, in the summer of 2021, when said the dollar could never rise again and subsequently went to all-time highs. The options positions betting against the dollar are near the highest level in the last two years. The bets on the euro to rise are getting close to their highest level in the last two years. Um, and this is a 40-year chart of the euro, and it shows it broke support. That, that support line is now resistance in the euro. So remember, if you're betting against the dollar, you're betting on the euro, the yen, and the other foreign currencies. This is the yen. The speculative bets on the yen, they have always been negative. Now, they're still negative, but not nearly as negative as they were four months ago. And it also broke a 40-year support line earlier this year, and it hasn't even bounced up to where the, the resistance is. So let's kind of review again. A lot of times, the arguments I get against the dollar and why the dollar just has to go lower is one of them is that our housing market is due to collapse, due to slowing growth and the high debt. That's true. But that's happening in China right now, and they have been intervening in their market to stop it while the U.S. has been raising rates. Another argument is that our pensions are wholly unfunded. You know, the Social Security is bankrupt. There's no money in there. They will have to weaken the dollar in order to meet those entitlement programs. Okay, they probably will at some point. But that exact thing happened this year in Great Britain, and the Central Bank of Great Britain the Bank of England had to bail out the, the guilt market as a result of the pensions almost going bankrupt. So all the worries about what's one day going to happen to the U.S. dollar is happening right now today in England. The other thing is the foreigners will no longer buy our debt. Now, in the last two or three months, all of the Treasury auctions have seen record demand from indirect buyers. Indirect buyers is translated as foreign buyers. But during that same time period, very few, if any, not even international buyers, but local buyers showed up in the Japan market. Japan has to monetize almost 100% of their bond market. They own over 50% of all the JGBs outstanding. So all of the people that are worried about the no foreigners buying the U.S. dollar debt, it's happening right now today in Japan.
And these all trade relative to each other. And then finally, they will have to go back to QE and they'll have to pull market, the rates down because they can't afford the spiking yields on the sovereign bonds. Again, this is happening right now today in Europe. The ECB, the ECB is buying the bonds of Italy and Spain and some of the other periphery economies to keep them from going bankrupt. So I hear all the arguments against the dollar. I think you should be concerned about them, but keep it in, keep it in uh, relation to all the competitors because currencies are a relative game. And again, I'm gonna stop with this slide here. This is the slide of the last, every crisis for the last 25 years. And then pink is the crisis and then blue and white is the dollar index. Every time we've had a crisis, the dollar has gone higher. Now, I don't know if it's gonna go higher next time or not. And I'm not here to tell you that it absolutely will go higher and you should put all your money in the dollar. I'm here to tell you, you should not bet everything that it's gonna go down because it usually doesn't. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you. I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask them. So he's asking at what point, at what level on the DXY do I think they would have to step in? And um, well, and you can see the other central banks already did step in around 115. They, they just couldn't take the pain anymore. As far as the Fed, you know, I really don't know. My guess is that around 120, 125, they're going to be doing a lot of things to, to try to tamp it down. But you got to remember, they can also use this as a weapon. They can do it on purpose. And I think to a certain extent, that's what they were doing last year. They were doing it on purpose to put the rest of the world under pressure. I actually think at some point it will get away from them and it will go higher than they want it to go. And then, then that's when the reset probably happens. But I think, you know, I think we could go from 125, 130 to 150 very quickly. And at that point, it's probably time to shut it all down. Well, I, I, think, I think there's not as much emotion now as there was initially. So that's my perception. But I think initially the reason the pushback against this was that the Fed would have to monetize, they'd have to print, and that automatically means the dollar goes down, even though the facts say differently. Um, I think the other thing is that, and listen, I, guys, I love gold. I think everybody should own gold. But I think, you know, the bedrock of the whole gold thesis is that the dollar is going to get inflated away, and therefore you have to own gold. And so when I would come out and say go, the dollar is going to go higher, it's kind of like, you know, it kind of goes against everything you've been taught about why to own gold in the first place. But I don't think that's the case. If all fiat gets the base together, again, dollar and gold can go up together versus everything else. So, so he asked two questions. What, how does China reopening affect the dollar? How has that affected it over the last four or five months? And how does the debt ceiling affect it going forward? So to be honest, I don't think China reopening has had much impact on the dollar. I think the pullback in the dollar is all about rate hike, rate hike, rate hike expectations relative to other countries' rate hike expectations. And as soon as the rate hike, the, the pace of rate, rate hikes slowed, the dollar still did the pullback. And I think that's the whole story, really, with regard to the dollar. But with the debt ceiling, that's actually an interesting point because right now, the dollar is very oversold. The positioning is all against it. There are a number of things that says the dollar should go higher. But the, the one caveat I would give and why I could say that's possible the dollar goes lower is that typically during, when you bump up against the debt ceiling and you can know the treasury can no longer issue bonds, that is typically a period of weakness for the dollar. And if you think about it, the reason is, is because the treasury has a bunch of cash from pre previous auctions and they send that out into the economy when they're spending money. So they're giving liquidity to the market. But if they're not selling bonds and pulling that liquidity back in, nothing is offsetting that liquidity. Typically there's, you know, they're offsetting the liquidity they're injecting by pulling it back out. And when you hit the debt ceiling, that doesn't happen. So if this debt ceiling debate or however you want to talk about it goes on for three, four, six months, it, it wouldn't shock me to see the dollar go lower. But to me, this does not, that just pushes the whole game out a year or two. It, it doesn't change the game, it just extends it. And then that's, a, that's the last thing I'll say and then I gotta go, is that I would recommend, and you do what you want, use periods of dollar weakness to prepare for dollar strengths. When you see the dollar falling, that is not a signal that the game is almost over. That is a signal that the game is getting pushed down the road. This is not going to get resolved until, you know, the whole system gets reset. And I think the only way the system gets reset is the dollar going higher. Anyway, thanks, everybody.